Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Bible in Order, where we are chronologically going through the entire Bible in one year. Today's reading for September 29th is Nehemiah chapters 11 through 13 and Psalm 126. The leaders of the people stayed in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots for one out of ten to come and live in Jerusalem. Family property for up to 70 years. Their land had been uncultivated. Their homes were dilapidated. And of course, everybody wanted to rush home and get their own homes in order. But somebody had to stay in Jerusalem. And so they drew straws, in a sense. They were casting lots so that 10% of the people would stay in Jerusalem. But some volunteered and the people blessed all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem, those who were so selfless that they said, I will maintain this holy city at the expense of putting my own home in order. I will put the needs of my family and my legacy and my lineage to the side and take care of the city that God has deemed the place where his glory will dwell. A lot of us want to give to God from our overflow. God, if you bless me, if I have extra, I'll give you back a piece of it. But very few are so focused on the kingdom of heaven that they're willing to forsake everything that they have, everything that they can lay claim to. The world wants to tell us to make a name for ourselves, build up our business, and then get to a place where we are able to sacrifice to God. And God is saying, no, the most blessed are the ones who lay it all down and follow me. Friends, what do you and I have to lay down to follow him? In chapter 12, verse 27, they begin dedicating the wall of Jerusalem to celebrate with joyous dedication, with thanksgiving and singing accompanied by cymbals, harps, and lyres. People came from all around to celebrate this joyous occasion. And it says in verse 30 that after the priests and Levites had purified themselves, they purified the people and the city gates and the wall. That word purified is the same word that's used in Malachi chapter 3, verse 3. It talks about a metalsmith burning off the dross. That word purify is used throughout the Hebrew Old Testament, and it refers to miraculously being purified, like being cured of leprosy. It refers to ceremonial cleansing or purification that the priests would have to perform after somebody offered sacrifice when they were being cleansed from their sin. It refers to moral purification, turning away from your sin and turning to the righteous life that God has placed before us. And it refers even to a physical cleansing or purification, like when you're bathing or you're going into the water to wash off dirt. We have to be purified. They purified themselves, and they also purified the people, but they also purified the city gates and the wall itself. There's an indication here that we need to spiritually cleanse the things around us and what we are dedicating to the Lord. Many of us have posted somewhere in our home the famous verse from Joshua that says, Choose you this day whom you shall serve. As for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. Friends, if we're dedicating our families and our homes to the service of God, we need to spiritually cleanse these places. Perhaps you need to cleanse your room or your house. There might be spiritual warfare taking place there that's keeping you from resting well in God. Whatever we do, whatever we have, let's purify it. Let's cleanse it. Let's make it holy for service set apart unto Yahweh. After the cleansing, we see two large groups of people travel all the way around Jerusalem on top of the wall, shouting praises. These these are thanksgiving choirs, and it must have taken hours to walk the two and a half mile circumference of the old city wall 
On that day, they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and children also celebrated, and Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard far away. Chapter 13, at that time, the book of Moses was read publicly to the people. The people heard the law and they acted. They set themselves apart. They removed the unholy people who were from them. Some people would say the Jews were racist or that Nehemiah was racist. And again, like we said before, it's not about the race. It's about the heart condition. It's about maintaining the culture of the people and the law handed down from God. There are lots of people throughout the genealogical record of Jesus, our Messiah himself, who were not Jewish. This is not about a race. It's about preserving the tradition of worshiping God and walking according to his statutes. Don't believe the lie of the enemy that tries to tell you God is a racist. In verse 6, I had returned to King Artaxerxes of Babylon in the 32nd year of his reign. Chapter 1 talks about all of this beginning in the 20th year. So it's been 12 years that it took to rebuild the city wall. Nehemiah was a cup bearer for the king, so he had to get back to his job. But then he starts learning about some of the things that are taking place, and he's furious and heartbroken. He says in verse 8, I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household possessions out of the room when he found that Tobiah, the one who stood in the way of the progress, the one who tried to kill Nehemiah, the one who tried to prevent the wall from being restored, was given a room in the house. How does this happen? Do you not know who this man is? Make no room for the enemy. He also found out that because the portions for the Levites had not been given, each of the Levites and the singers performing the service had gone back to his own field. The Levites, in their graciousness and their humility, did not demand to be compensated for their time. They just said, well, I guess if you can't pay us or if you're not going to pay us, we'll just go back and provide for ourselves. And so the people of God had not been taking care of the people who were ministering to God. We think of pastors and church leaders today as those who are serving the community, who are shepherding the flock for the sake of the flock. And some of that is deserved because there are a lot of shepherds who are doing it for the sake of the flock. But friends, if you're doing it for the sake of the sheep and not for the sake of the one who created the sheep, your priorities are amiss and you will most definitely be burned out. The Levites were ministering to God, not just to the people. And the people did not support the ministry to God. They were neglecting God. And as a result, they themselves ended up being neglected. How quickly we fall back into our old sin patterns. So Nehemiah rebuked the officials in verse 11. Why has the house of God been neglected? Then he has to remind them and rebuke them again for working on the Sabbath day. It's a day that is holy unto God. We should rest and meditate on the word of God on the Sabbath day. Christians under grace would say that we no longer have to keep the law, and you don't have to. We all get a choice, but you're missing out on a tremendous opportunity if you are not celebrating the Sabbath. We are not under legalism. God's not just waiting for us to mess up so that he can rebuke us and correct us and discipline us. But he's saying these things exist for you. But he's also saying when you observe this, when you rest in this, this will be a blessing to you. Jesus said in Mark chapter 2 verse 27 that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's on account of. The Sabbath was made because of. In a sense, it was made for us. We weren't made for it. God is giving it to us. It's a gift for us. It's for our good. In Psalm 126, 
when Yahweh restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. When God restored the captives from the land of exile, it felt like a dream. Have you ever been on the mountaintop like that, that it just felt like a dream? It seemed too good to be true. Our mouths were filled with laughter then, our tongues with shouts of joy, so much so that the nations around were amazed and kept talking about how fortunate and how blessed we were. Friends, when you're on the mountaintop, some people are going to talk about you. You might be known for your joy and how life is so good for you in that moment. It's like when people succeed and they're called an overnight success. There's a joke among people who have achieved some level of success who say, yeah, it was an overnight success, all right. It was 25 years in the making. For the Israelite people, it was 70 years in the dark, in exile, serving a foreign king, having their children indoctrinated with a foreign culture, learning different languages outside of their homeland. It was 70 years of being decimated, of watching their homeland decay, watching their houses fall in, of having their crops and fields overrun with wild animals and people taking what was theirs 70 years. And so when it was restored, yes, they were joyous. But that's why it says in verse 5, those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. You don't really fully appreciate the victory until you've had to work through it. It's through blood, sweat, and tears that the victory really is appreciated. You have to go through some hard times to fully appreciate the good times. The people went through some hard times. We are going through some hard times. We get to choose right now. Do we want to suffer now by denying our flesh so that we can rejoice later when we are transformed more fully into the image of God? If you believe the cheap gospel that you can just ask Jesus into your heart and you don't have to be conformed into his image, that someday he's going to return or you're going to die and go to him and just be made like him, but you don't have to put in the hard work, friends, you're, you've been lied to. It doesn't work that way. You don't get big muscles and a trim waist by dying and going to fitness heaven. You don't get to sit around and eat ice cream and watch Netflix and become healthy. That's a physical analogy, but God gave us physical bodies to demonstrate spiritual truths. You don't become spiritually mighty by watching Netflix and reading romance novels. It's by denying yourself, doing the thing you don't want to do and becoming a people of the word. You might not want to get up at five o'clock or six o'clock every morning and read your Bible, but do it anyway. You will either sacrifice those things now or wish that you had later. It's the way it works in the kingdom. It's very real to not want to pray. It's very real to not want to sit and read your Bible and to have that daily discipline. And that's why we have to pray and say, God, help me. God, change me. Make me want to pray. Help me pray, God. Father, I don't want to read your word. Change me. Make me want to read your word. Give me a love for your word, Father. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who walk according to the Spirit, friends. This is not meant to condemn. This is meant to encourage. We never know how much longer we have. Make the most of every day. God bless you. Thank you for being on this journey with me. We'll see you tomorrow.